speak to that as it was something that upon recollection we did discuss and come out all that uh, up on this <clears throat> machine. Uh, somebody needs to turn it on. Who has the... That's fine. <clears throat> I'll not belabor the point. Just, it all comes, of course, from 3911-503, intoxication under subsection B, which says, if recklessness establishes an, an element of an offense, not the element, but right. an element, and a person is unaware of a risk because of voluntary intoxication, the person's unawareness is immaterial in a prosecution for that offense. Not for that element, but for that offense. And I believe we, <clears throat> both sides, submitted perhaps jury uh, instructions that ended up with the one Your Honor gave. The comments to Section 503, 3911-503, Section B makes it clear that voluntary intoxication can never negate awareness of a risk where recklessness is sufficient to establish a culpable mental state for an offense. The recklessness goes to the whole part of the aggravated rape, which I believe is instructions that ended up with the one Your Honor gave. The comments to Section 503, 3911-503, Section B makes it clear that voluntary intoxication can never negate awareness of a risk where recklessness is sufficient to establish a culpable mental state for an offense. The recklessness goes to the whole part of the aggravated rape, which I believe is what we discussed, in that the intoxication, even assuming that he was <coughs> intoxicated, would create the risk of penetration. The penetration does not have to be with an awareness. The penetration can be reckless. As could his, theoretically, being unaware of the state of his victim. And that intoxication carries over. That risk of the unawareness is a direct result of the voluntary intoxication and I believe the cases that I had that we discussed was State versus Fred Chad Clark at 452 Southwest 3rd, 268, Tennessee Supreme Court, which began next door, Judge Fishburne's court. It was, <clears throat> pardon me, rape of a child case, but they get to discussing about the elements and the recklessness that the unlawful sexual penetration may be done intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, as could the awareness of how many people are out of the conduct. It <clears throat> reckless applies to the circumstances surrounding a defendant's conduct or to the result of the defendant's conduct. Voluntary intoxication can never be a defense to that. So all of the circumstances surrounding that are part and parcel of the same. And I believe we also discussed State versus Parker, which is at 887 Southwest 2nd, 825. It was a Court of Criminal Appeals case, uh, permission to appeal denied. And in that case, the issue was the defendant's recklessness regarding the age of his victim. That, that again, part and parcel of the idea of recklessness, and that would be sufficient to support the conviction. What we had in this case was taking all those into account where the principal offender claims voluntary intoxication by virtue of the statute and the case law. It applies to the offense, not just to portions of the offense, but the, to the entire offense. And that was the wording that we came up with it is not and cannot ever be a defense to aggravated rape or to any offense where recklessness supplies the culpable mental state. Now, obviously, as to criminal responsibility of conduct of another or the aggravated sexual battery, we're dealing with that because it's a knowing state. But as the aggravated rape, it is not a defense and cannot be.
Your Honor, I'd first like to point out I'm not um, in reading the transcript of the trial. I did not uh, see where this was ever uh, discussed or ruled on, albeit, albeit it may have. Um, the Tennessee pattern instructions for the defense of intoxication, they were updated in September 2015, Your Honor. And uh, the trial was in January of 2015. So um, I don't know exactly what the ones that uh, were utilized in the first trial say or if they even had that part that says it's no defense to that element in there. I will point that out. Now, Your Honor, um, the state basically has uh, pointed out that the defendant, uh, it can't be a defense when the culpable mental state is intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. And I would have your honor note that under aggravated rape seems to incorporate in the comments former Tennessee pattern instructions 3.02 aiding and abetting. And it is clear with aiding and abetting that there must be some evidence, at least circumstantial, that the defendant knowingly participated in the crime. The defendant must have had knowledge of the crime being committed and an intent to aid and abet. Now, further in the reckless, in the intoxication statute, it states, in the TPI instructions, I apologize. Whether voluntary or involuntary, it is relevant to the issue of the essential element of the defendant's culpable mental state. As I pointed out earlier, there are multiple mental states in this one statute. And one of the things, the elements that the state has to prove is that the defendant was aided or abetted by one or more persons. And that's going to require intent to aid in the bed. He had to have knowledge of the crime and an intent to aid in the bed. And then you're going to come down and the defendant has to have known or had reason to know the alleged victim was physically helpless, mentally defective, mentally incapacitated. And that the defendant acted either intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. Your Honor, I submit that if the defendant, um, as, as far as recklessly penetrating somebody, okay. But Your Honor, they chose to bring charges of aggravated rape. And one of the elements include aiding and abetting. And that requires intent. And intoxication, as it states, and Your Honor has, on the back, that the defendant's unawareness is immaterial and is no defense to that element in the prosecution of said offense. So intoxication won't be a, and I'm speaking slowly because the court reporter, she was trying to get it from me, and I apologize for speaking so fast last time. But it's immaterial and it's no defense to that element in the pro prosecution of said offense. And Your Honor, yeah, it's no defense to whether he acted intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. But the statute clearly states out, and you have to prove this other element. And puts in the former TPI instructions that say it needs intent. And they have to prove this element, element that requires knowingly. So I submit, Your Honor, that that is critical and cannot be disregarded. And um, I ask that Your Honor instruct as such. Like one last sure. one. He is not the aider and abetter in counts one through four. That's the whole point. Yeah. Uh, I think, as, as Jim Moore pointed out, if, if the culpable mental state was knowing, then you have something. But when it comes reckless uh, in this particular case, then it's different. Uh, I'm more convinced, uh, as, I, as I ruled this morning, however, I do want to get a chance to look at the cases cited by Joe Moore, and uh, I'll give my final determination after reading those two cases. But, uh, Actually, Judge, I happen to have copies. Yeah, please. And that's why I have to also the response to what General Moore just said. 
said, he said he's not charged with aiding and abetting, but that is also that is still an element that has to be proven. I don't, it's as part of aggravated rape, and it still has to be proven regardless if he's aiding and abetting or not. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to read these cases and let you know. And, and it would also be our argument, Your Honor, that that specific reference is a clarification, not in addition to, but a clarification as to that particular element. Okay, thank you all. Y'all, oh. I'm sorry, you state that, that first case I didn't hear, State v. It was State v. Clark, which is uh, cited as 453 Southwest 3rd. Is that 268? I believe so. And the other one, State, the other one, State v. Parker, that's uh, 887 Southwest 2nd, 825. Thank you, Honor. All right. Your Honor, if I may, before we begin, the State filed a motion requesting that witnesses and the State be allowed to reference the victim as the victim. Right. Um, Lieutenant Detective Harville, because of the last trial, he's been referring to her as the alleged yeah, victim. And I didn't know if Your Honor was going to issue a ruling. Well, I mean, I agreed with what you uh, put forth last week about uh, using the term victim and alleged victim. I can only refer to her as alleged victim, but others may refer to her to her as a victim. The uh, and I mean, I know how Detect uh, Lieutenant Harville referred to her this morning. I heard it about 50 times. Yes. Uh, so, but I wasn't going to just stop him and say, don't say that, you know. So, all right. Okay, let's let's move on. Bring them in. Yes, you can come on up. You're gonna have to do the lights again because oh, we we're, we're close to finishing up on this portion. Do they sit down, so. Okay, yeah, good idea. I don't to trip. Good idea. <laughs> Our budget's get lower every week. Our budget has been busted for a while. Please be seated. All right, how was lunch today? All right, it's going to even get better. Okay. For the record, we ended on clip 29 at 3 31. Which video is this? 29. Lieutenant Harville, I just read the time stamp, but if you could look at the time stamp. I think we just had a jump again. Yes, the time stamp is 3.33.20. Okay, you're, you're coming up. 3.33.20. And could you describe again what just happened? Is that anything unusual? The time skip? No, ma'am. Um, the uh, NICE system does that uh, quite Quite frequently. And when it appears to be Mr. Vandenberg walking towards the end of the corridor of East Hall, towards uh, 
Mr. Dylan Wall's room. Mr. Vanden Wall's, I'm sorry. <coughs> Lieutenant Harville, the next kind of approximately eight to ten minute segment, could you describe what, if anything, happens? I believe you have people coming in and out of their rooms. With the court's permission, Your Honor, I will increase the playback speed of this section. Okay. Lieutenant Arbel, can you describe what yeah, we've just that seen? That was uh, appeared to be Mr. Uh, Dylan Vandenwall walking out of Mr. Samuel's room and going into his room. That's Ms. Uh, appears to be Mr. Retta coming out of his room and walking, I believe, towards um, Mr. Samuel's room. This Ms. appears to be Mr. Retta going back to his room. Should I have the playback on approximately two times the speed? That's Mr. Boyd. Uh, appears to be Mr. Boyd coming out of his room and going into Mr. Vandenwall's room. This appears to be Mr. Boyd, Mr. Vandenwall, Dylan Vandenwall, and Mr. Vandenberg. Uh, all three of them appears to be going into Mr. Samuel's room. And Mr. Samuel's? That appears to be Mr. Retta going into um, Mr. Samuel's rooms as well. Here's be Mr. Boyd, Mr. Vandenberg, Mr. Retta, all coming out of what appears to be Mr. Samuel's room, and now they appear to be standing in the corridor of East Hall. There appears to be Mr. Better um, took a phone from, I got the phone from Mr. Vandenberg and appears to be looking at the uh, phone in his right hand, I believe. Appears Mr. Retta going back to his room and then Mr. Vandenberg is still standing in the corridor and now uh, Mr. Dylan Vandenwall has come out into the corridor and now going into or opening the door of Mr. Boyd's room. Appears that Mr. Vandenberg is going towards Mr. Dillonwall's room and Mr. Dillonwall is going back toward into Mr. Samuel's room. And again, I'm gonna increase the playback speed to two times. Okay, this appears to be Mr. Dylan Wall leaving Mr. Samuel's room, going back into his room. That appears to be Mr. Austin Curtis Samuel um, coming out of his room. It appears he's going into Mr. Uh, Dylan Wall's room. And again, I'm going to increase the playback speed to two times. I 
I believe we just had another skip of the clock. Yes, for yes, about yes, nine we minutes. Did. That's uh, Mr. Samuels coming out of Mr. Denwall's room and appears to be going back into his room. And again, I'm increasing the playback speed. Yes, it appears to be Mr. Samuels coming out of his room and, and peering into or opening a door of Mr. Retta's and Mr. Boyd's room. Now it appears that Mr. Samuel is going towards Mr. Dillon Wall's room, and now Chris Boyd appears to be coming out of his room going towards Mr. Dillon Wall's room. Mr. Dillon Van Wall, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Harville, if you can note the timestamp, I believe it's 401.31, and then now it's 4.13.30. It's just skipped at 4.13.30. Yeah, it's so just we, skipped at 4.13.30. So we skipped about 12 minutes of non-activity, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's just done by the system? Yes, ma'am. The, the NICE system does a skip when it's not recording any activity. It appears to be Mr. Boyd coming out of Mr. Dillon Wall's room, Mr. Car Samuels coming out, and now Mr. Dillon Van Der Waal coming out of the room, and all three of them appear to be standing in the corridor. Appears to be Mr. Vandenberg that came out of Mr. Dillon Wall's room and approaching the three individuals standing in the East Corridor, and they appear to me to be uh, communicating. Please. Please. What? what time is that? Please. It is 4 4 1638 is when Mr. Vandenberg exited Mr. Dillon Dill Vander Wall's room.
Okay, at this point, it appears that Mr. Samuel went back to his room. It appears that Mr. Vandenberg is going back towards Mr. Dillonwall's room. And now Mr. Vandenberg is went into Mr. Dillon, uh, Dillon Vandenwall's room. It appears that Mr. Dillon Vandenwall and Mr. Boyd is still outside in the corridor. It appears Mr. Vandenberg has came out of Mr. Dylan Wall's room, Dylan Vandenwall's room, and appears handed something to Mr. Boyd. Mr. Boyd appears to go into his room. Mr. Vandenberg appeared to go into Mr. Dillon Vandenwall's room. Lieutenant Harville, we're now at clip 30. Could you describe what is shown here? Yes, that's Gillette, second floor, West Corridor. Uh, same uh, cam videos, camera we looked at before, looking towards room 214, 213, and time frame is 9 45 a.m. That appears to be Mr. Vandenberg walking back towards, uh, appears to be his room area, and he appeared to pick up a towel from somewhere, carrying it back to his uh, room. Lieutenant Harville, during your investigation, you reviewed multiple views of surveillance video. Could you describe that surveillance video and how it relates? relates to the last image that we saw Mr. Vandenberg. The last image we saw Mr. Vandenberg was over <clears throat> East Hall. That particular video clip of him coming back the next morning uh, to his room. It's clip number 31. Could you describe what is shown in this clip? Yeah, it's the same corridor. And could you note the timestamp? Yes, ma'am. It's 3:26:43. Appears now uh, the uh, tile was taken off of the camera. And this is a 49-minute and nine-second video clip. Could you generally describe what is shown in this 49 <clears throat> minutes? Yes, ma'am. You see uh, uh, different people walking in and out of the bathroom area and into the corridor. At any point, do you see any of the parties involved, Mr. Vandenberg, Mr. Beatty, Mr. Banks, Mr. McKenzie, or the victim in this case? What, what time does it go to again? It is 49 minutes, and it goes until... With the court's permission, I'm going to increase the playback speed. All right.
Lieutenant Harville, could you note the time stamp? We're on eight times playback speed. Yes, ma'am. The time stamp is four. Now it's four thirty. A fifteen. And can you note the time stamp now? Uh, four forty three forty five. And this is back to normal playback speed. If you could describe what if anything occurs. Describe what if anything occurs. There appears to be an unidentified female going into the bathroom. It appears that the victim is coming around the corner. Um, it appears that she's at the water fountain. And she's having a, it looks like a blue towel, a green towel around her, around her waist, and it appears she's going into the bathroom. And I believe if we have a couple of minutes of non-activity, I'm going to increase the speed just to two times. Okay. If you could let me know if you see anything pertinent and I will slow it down. Harville, I've returned it to normal playback speed. Could you note the timestamp? Yes, this is 045708. It appears to be the victim coming out of the bathroom, walking <coughs> towards, uh, appears to be room 214, as she's standing in front of the door.
appear that, that she's still standing in front of the door. It appears that her arm is still in the video surveillance. appears that the victim has moved off from the front of the door of uh, room 214. And again, I believe we have just a couple of minutes of non-activity. I'm just going to increase it two times. Okay. Uh, it appears to be something uh, um, standing in front of the door of room 214. And it, to me, it appeared as being the victim's arm. It appears that the door is opening of room 214. Again, I've set it up two times. If you see anything, if you'll let me know. I'm sorry, I said I was increasing the speed play two times. If the witness sees anything, to let me know and I will stop it. Lieutenant Harville, I've returned it to regular speed. Okay, uh, that appears to be the victim coming from the area of room 213, and uh, she, she has the, the blue green towel around her waist, and appears she's going. I'm sorry, and appears she's going into the uh, bathroom. The time frame is 5 to 28, I think, when she came out. And again, I'm going to increase the playback speed if you'll let me know if you see anything.
time frame is now 5.545 and it appears that the victim is again in front of room 214. Lieutenant Harbaugh, I'm going to increase the playback speed. If you see anything occur, let me know. returned it to regular speed it, um, time frame is 510 uh, and appears appears to be the victim again standing in front of the room 214 Now this uh, time frame is 5 11 33 appears that the victim is walking back towards the bathroom area and she has the um, green bluish towel around her waist and she's now uh, appears she's going into the bathroom area I'm going to increase the playback speed to two times let me know if you see anything
And this appears to be room 214. And it appears she's standing in front of the door of room 214. Lieutenant Harville, again, I'm going to increase the playback speed if you can let me know. From this point in time, the end of the clip ends at 8.03.56 or 53. I don't think she does appear. I'm not for sure, but I don't think she does appear until after that. And I believe, can you notate the current time? Yes, the current time is 7.07.40. And so, again, the motion sensor function of the camera is... It skipped uh, when it didn't receive any activity. I'm going to increase the playback speed to eight times. If you see anything of note, please stop me. I might point out that there was a couple that looked like they went into the restroom, but I don't think they have anything to do with this case. Yes, Your Honor. And Lieutenant Harville, if you see okay. unrelated people, if you can just indicated okay. for the record. Well, two people just walked out of the bathroom and left the bathroom. It appears to have been going out of the uh, corridor. One person appeared just walking to the bathroom. I believe that was at approximately 7.51. Yes, ma'am.
in uh, Admiral. Eight o'clock, eight oh one. The person came out of the bathroom, appeared to go to get some uh, water at the water fountain, and leaves out of the corridor. Appeared to go to get some uh, water at the water fountain, and leaves out. Lieutenant Harville, this is clip number thirty-three. Could you describe what is shown here? It's the same corridor. It's still at second floor west corridor in the time frame. Is eight o three fifty five. If you could okay. describe what, if anything, is shown in this image. Yes, ma'am. It appears to be the victim again, standing in front of room two fourteen. This door. that the victim left room uh, in front of room 214. The time frame was around 8.05, uh, 30, I believe. Okay, it's about 8.05, 45. Again, the victim appeared. Five uh, thirty, I believe. <coughs> a, um, a white male coming out of a, the other side. Approximately, I believe it's 807.35, it appears to be, um, looks like an arm to me, in front of room uh, 814. I mean 214.
it now appears at 8.08.10 at the door of room 214 open and appeared that the uh, victim went inside the door. Lieutenant Harbaugh, I believe that we have a period of non-activity. I'm going to increase the playback speed. If you see anything, if you could please point it out. Okay. The male that was in the bathroom appears at around 8.09.30, came out of the bathroom and went around the other side, on the other side of the uh, corridor. have returned the playback feed to real time. If you could describe what if anything occurs. Appears that the door opened at around Einstein coming out. Appears we've been some Bernstein coming out of the door and going out of the corridor. I'm going to increase the playback speed. Let me know if you notice anything.
Then I have ever returned it to real time play. If you could let us know if you see anything. Yes, eight thirty. Um, appears to be the victim walking out of room two fourteen. It appears that she went into the bathroom. I will increase the speed again. And it's 8.30, 30 I've returned it to real-time playback. Okay, it appears to be the victim coming out of the bathroom. It appears as she's going back towards room uh, 214. And now she opens, it appears she opens the door and enters room 214. Now, 8.31.54, it appears that the victim is coming out of room 214 to the corridor and walking past the video camera out the corridor of Gillette, second floor. Okay, 8.30 to 20, uh, that's Mr. Uh, appears to be Jake, uh, Jake Bernstein, uh, the victim on the, appears to be the victim on the left and another female on the right. And they're all going towards uh, room 214 and appears to be entering into room 214. And this next clip is number 34. Could you describe what's shown here? Yes, this is the same corridor, Gillette second uh, floor, west corridor, uh, and it's the same uh, corridor, and the time frame is 11.50.29 a.m. Could you describe what we're seeing? Yes, the, uh, um, the female coming out of room 214 with the victim appears to be uh, coming out of room 214 and going towards the corridor. And then this is the last clip, which is number 35. Could you describe what is shown here? Yes, this is the Let Circle black vehicle, and it appears and it appears now now to be the 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 uh, appears to be the victim walking towards the vehicle with the other female with her. Okay, and then this is the last clip, which is number 35. And the timestamp is approximately 11:52:20. Yes, ma'am, 1152 in the course of the investigation. After uh, reviewing the uh, most of the surveillance video, uh, I contacted Metro Sex Crime Division and asked for the media assistance. Sex Crime Division asked for the media assistance. And are you aware of who the lead detective was that was assigned to this case? Yes, it was Detective Mayo. And at any point, have you had contact with Mr. Corey Beatty? After the, uh, no. Are you familiar with him? Had you had contact with him prior to this? Yes. And do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. And could you point him out? Yes, he's the uh, male black sitting in the back behind counsel in a, in a gray suit with a dark color tie. Thank you, Lieutenant Harville. I don't have any other questions. All right, before we start cross-examination, let me see the lawyers for just one minute.
right, ladies and gentlemen, since it's so close to our break time, we're going to go ahead and take our break and for the next 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and resume, okay? Lord, you reset 15 minutes. 